driving through Central Texas, you could just imagine the cowboys riding the plains. I'm down here to visit Wilson Capron, a bitten spur maker who's working on reminding everyone about the sophistication of cowboy culture. Now I've dressed up as a cowboy tons of times for Halloween, so it's gonna be real cool to hang out with the real deal. A craftsman battles for perfection, never willing to give in or walk away. I'm Eric Gorgeous. I build custom motorcycles using skills passed on by countless generations before me. I used to work nine to five, chasing money and titles, and it nearly broke me. So I started over. I decided to work with my hands to feed my soul. Please join me on a quest to uncover the skills that built our society we'll discover what drives the men and women who I call my heroes. We'll learn their craft and maybe even find some inspiration along the way. There's a part of you in everything you create, your legacy, a craftsman's legacy. My dad was a cowboy, cowboy first, and so we grew up on the ranch. It's a way of life, you know, it's not a job, it's a way of life. Sure. It's, it's non-stop, 24-7. I grew up in that culture, grew up in that environment, and it's a part of who I am, and it's something I, I really am passionate about. The cowboy culture. Sure. Is that important to you? Absolutely. It's a part of our history. It's a part of how the West was found, and, and you know, uh, I'll say Hollywood is has uh, done a really good job of depicting an uneducated drunk that takes a bath once a week. Uh, that's not who the West is. We've been misrepresented a little bit, and, and uh, there's a sophistication and an elegance to the West, and, and uh, an attitude that uh, is very similar to the, to the culture that you live in, with motorcycles and all that, of, of a real free-spirited, there's a bit of ruggedness to it, right? Sure. Uh, but, but there's also a bit of elegance and refinedness to that culture. So growing up that way, you are very familiar with working with your hands. Growing up as a kid, I always wanted to make something. Yeah. And my, my dad is a, is a painter. Uh, oh, really? An artist. Art has been involved in my family, and I would draw on stuff occasionally and, and try to uh, participate with him. But I always fell back to wanting to make something. I wanted to create something. I luckily got into this. I started making bits and spurs as a, for, as a way to rodeo. As, as a way to pay my entry fees to, to go to the rodeos. All right, and how did you get into that? Accidentally, to tell you the truth, I, I was uh, going to college, a uh, rodeo guy, I enjoyed uh, team roping. I enjoyed athletics in high school and all that, so I got into roping and loved every minute of it. It was a big part of my deal. Pretty exciting. Oh, very exciting. Yeah, I get to see the country. We go to a lot of jackpots and different things like that and travel around. It's so different for me being from Detroit. You know, we don't we don't have a lot of rodeos in Detroit. Right. <laughs> right. I understand. I understand. I wish we did though. It is a cool thing. It's a, it's it's a part of a part of our past, you know, in a certain way in the, in the wild wild west. I mentored, apprenticed under a guy for for three years. I worked for him. So where were you when you were apprenticing for this other maker? I was in a little town northeast of Dallas uh, named Lone Oak. And you worked for a company that made bit and spurs? Yes, sir. Um, Greg Darnell was my mentor. Okay. And and uh, he he had a very large production company. Uh, we built about 1,500 bits a month. Wow. Uh, yeah, it was mass production at, at the finest. It was a very good foundation for me to to learn how to build the individual pieces. I didn't want to be a bit and spur maker, so I wasn't worried about the decoration at that point. It was, I was making a paycheck. It was giving me a weekly wage that I could rodeo and pay the entry fees and support my hero's families, I think. <laughs> 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 but uh, it was good for me because I didn't get carried away. Uh, about a, a year and a half into working for Greg, um, I, he asked me if I wanted to, to engrave, learn to engrave, and I said, and you think I can? He said, sure. It's just like you're roping, uh -huh. just practice. And it was just like my rope, and it was addictive. I, I craved it, loved it, and, and away I went. So you fell in love in, with engraving? Absolutely. I, and that was my first love. In the beginning, um, 
There wasn't a market for high-end engraving on bits and spurs in our Western culture. There wasn't a way to get paid for that. Oh. To spend two or three months engraving a bit, uh, you get paid for a week of it, and that was it. Right, right. So I actually, in the beginning, thought that the, the firearms engraving, knife engraving, would be something of interest, and I would use my bits and spurs um, as a way to practice and a way I'd go. Since that time, there, um, there's been a huge appreciation for the engraving and the elegance of that uh, in our Western culture. And so our market has developed, and I'm not overly interested in engraving knives or guns because I, I love the West. Right. And so it's a way for me to stay connected with the horse and the, and the cowboy, you know. Sure. And what are you using as far as design goes? The inspiration comes from me everywhere. Sometimes I'll create something and and... The Western culture may look at me a little funny and say, kid, what, what are you doing? I mean, that, that's a little <laughs> out there a little bit. But I, I, Cal, There are different regions of the West that have different styles. Uh, California has a very specific style that was more known for elegance. Um, Texas was, a, was a, a more rugged, rough piece that wasn't of the fine engraving, but a very durable usable piece you know mm -hmm. so I, I bleed it all together and then Mexico being a southern neighbor and close growing up with Mexico they also had a specific style I get them all three mixed up my big old bowl well it's your style sure it's me it's very contemporary in a way I'm not trying to reinvent the wheel I want somebody when they see a spur or see one of my bits say, hey that's a bit or that's a pair of spurs and then they go wow that's a pretty bit or a pretty pair of spurs like that that's really nice but first and foremost it has to represent what I'm doing you know I always give this analogy a Porsche is made to drive really good right mm -hmm. but you don't go mudding in your Porsche usually <laughs> that's kind of what I'm trying to do is, I got you. Is, is you can absolutely use it there's no sense in doing it if you can't use it but it can be awfully nice pretty well made too so do you see yourself as more of an artist or a craftsman craft sometimes can have a, a negative connotation um, craft is a very it's a very beautiful word to me because you're working with your hands and you're creating. It is art, though. It's absolutely art. And art is in everything. Between your bikes, a car, it doesn't matter. Art is involved. Design had to start somewhere. And if you don't have good design, which is art, you don't have anything at the end of the day, no matter how good your craft is. So uh, I am a craftsperson that will accept the term artist. How's that? I like that. Right. Now, you belong to a, an organization of cowboy artists. Yes, sir. Sure. Traditional Cowboy Arts Association. We're preserving and promoting the disciplines of rawhide braiding, saddle making, bit and spur making, and silversmithing. Those four disciplines uh, are represented by 12 individuals, 12 active individuals right now between Canada, United States, and Argentina. They're my heroes. They're the best of the world. So I, don't, I, I hate to say that about myself, but those guys are the best of the best. Sure. It's quite an honor to be a part of that. It, information wasn't shared very freely not too long ago. Um, now it's open. We want. It's, I'll tell. I'll tell you everything I know. Uh, I'll give you my designs. That's what I'm here for. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> but it, it, it's it's. Uh, I want to share that that knowledge with you um, and and make you better, which it, it preserves the West, right? Absolutely. Our heritage. So does that cause you to think about your legacy ever? Teaching other people, sharing your knowledge, making something so high end. You know, they, yes. 150 years after I'm done, they'll forget who I am probably. Wilson Capron will just be a, a dude of, of the past. But I would love for somebody to look at a bit or a pair of spurs I've done and go, I have no idea who that was, but that's incredible. That's well done. And, and that's important to me, you know, do the best possible job I can each and every day, get, continue to get better for as long as I possibly can. And, and uh, that will last, I think. So what do you think? You about ready to get to work? Absolutely. I know, I'm tired of talking. Throw some sparks and enjoy. <laughs> Absolutely. What are we gonna make? We'll make a pair of spurs. A pair of spurs, pair of spurs. awesome. Absolutely, be fun. Excellent. Spurs have been used by horsemen all over the world throughout the ages. The design varies widely depending upon the region and the wearer. The first recorded version of the Rowled Spur appeared on the seal of Henry III, dating from 1240. During the Age of Chivalry, spurs became associated with rank. A knight would wear gold spurs 
and an Esquire silver. From this, we get the expression, earning one's spurs. Over the years, spurs in Europe became simpler, but in the Americas, more elaborate designs flourished. In Mexico and the Western United States, the spur became an integral part of the vicuero and cowboy culture. With his intricately engraved, handcrafted spurs, Wilson Capron has carved his own place in this proud cowboy tradition. I'm not much of a gambler, but I bet we're gonna heat up some metal. Here we go. <laughs> Here we go, gonna get hot. So we're gonna make some spurs. Absolutely. And what do you have there? What I have is a spur band. A spur band. That's why we call it, this gonna be the part that goes around the boot, forms okay. the boot heel. All right, so we're gonna put this in the forge, get it hot, and then it's gonna go over to your jig here. Absolutely. So what we'll do is we'll stick it in there, get it hot, I'll pull it out, or you'll pull it out, we're gonna stick it in here. We'll, we'll, we'll square it up there, get our boot heel jig, locate it right there, roll this deal down, and then pull it down. Once it gets down in there, uh, not all the way to the bottom, but pretty good ways, we'll square it up with a hammer, make sure it's flat up against, and then you can go ahead and pull down and make sure it flattens out. All right, cool. Here we go. Let's do it. that in there for just a little bit just a minute it won't take too long it'll get hot uh, the important part is it's hot in the center that's where the most of the bend is going to come from okay so we'll just wait for it to get hot and then we'll stick it in there they say a watch pot never boils don't look at it we about ready i'm ready when you are yeah there you go perfect There you go. Perfect. Now just roll her down. There you go. But pull fast. Yeah, keep going a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. Keep going, keep going. All right, now you can now you can take the hammer and just kind of there you go. Now bottom it out. Put six five into it. There it is. Perfect. Done deal. Good? Good. We'll pull it out. This look at there. Ah, oh, look at that. There it is. Now get a hold of it with the tongs. All right, so what's next? What we'll do is weld the shank on next. Oh, okay. Where it just sticks out the back. All right, shut down the forge? Shut her down. A lot quieter now. Huh? <laughs> We're sitting in front of a welder. And it looks like you've done a little bit of prep work on that strap. Absolutely. Uh, coming out of the forge, uh, we had a bunch of fire scale on it. So I've taken it to a sand blaster, removed the fire scale, uh, and then to a disc sander and cleaned up the sides, made them square. All right. And what are we getting ready to weld? So we're going to weld the shank on, the part that holds the rowel. The, the rowel? The rowel. The star thingy. The star thingy. Yeah. There we go. Star thingy. <laughs> That's called a rowel? The rowel. I like that. Yeah. Sweet welding. Is that okay? Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. All right, we're ready for the other fixture. So we got it clamped on. Here? Yeah. yeah. You want to hold it? Sure. All right.
This is looking good. I've come a long ways. Yeah, yeah. Bring me up to speed on what we did. So what we did is uh, take it over to the belt sander mm -hmm. um, and cleaned up your welds. It didn't need much cleaning, did no. it? No. Put some taper on the shank mm -hmm. and and uh, and then slotted it for our row to go through there. The star thingy. The star thingy, all absolutely. Right. Drilled a hole for the pin that will that will brad in to, to secure all of that, and uh, and then and moved everything to a, all the way up to a 400 grit finish. So what's our next step here? To weld the hinge pins in, to to hammer them in and then weld them in place. And where do those go? So they're gonna go in these holes that we've drilled down here at the end over our slots. Okay, And is that these? That's yeah, those, absolutely. Grab one of those. And what is this for? This is for the, the button, and the button is a hinge. Um, that's where the spur leathers attach, is that, that button that we're gonna brad on the end of that is where the spur leathers attach. That's what keeps it on your boot? Absolutely, that keeps it in place. I got you, so we're gonna tap these on and then just weld them in place from the back? Weld them in place from the back, that's right. Easy awesome. peasy. You got it. And you can tap figures. No, this in. Yep, a little bit more. A little bit more. You got a brass hammer, so you can go ahead and whack it. Yeah, that's what we like. Oh, there we go. Yeah. And may, may, so maybe on that end, do the same kind of treatment. Watch the thumb. Perfect. Yeah, it looks good. Stick that clamp on there like that, and that way it holds it good. Slick. That's not easy to do. You made it look easy. It's just a hole. It's just a hole. <laughs> you did good. <laughs> All right. So we've got to clean these up a little bit, I'm thinking. So what we'll do is go to the belt sander now and, and uh, clean up the inside. OK, cool. I really like this setup you got here, man. It's a great place to be. I spend a lot of time here. I really dig it because you can access it all the way around. It telescopes up and down for different different tasks. And when I'm working real close to my face with the optivizers and all that, I can. This moves up and down? Yes, absolutely. Now you're just playing with me. I'm stealing this for my shot. Oh, absolutely. So what are we going to make here? And we'll build the hinge and then, and then we'll also file some rounds. And this is the hinge right here. What they're going to take a piece of 14 gauge steel and I put it in a jig and wrap it around a piece of 3 16 inch round stuff, round stock. Okay, and then this goes on the hinge pin that we welded just earlier. Absolutely, it goes on there, which uh, then will the button will, will go into the hole that you're seeing there, yes. And uh, that's where the spur leather will attach to it, which holds the spur on the boot. Right on, <laughs> this is nice looking. And then this is probably one of the coolest things I've ever seen. Well, the old row. That's what everybody thinks of when you see a pair of spurs. This is what you hear clicking? Jing, jing, jing. Yeah. That's it, the singing. That's it. Oh, man, that's that's like... what makes all the noise. These things are little tuning forks, actually. So as they hit the ground, hit something, they jing, jing. So that's what makes them Super cool. sing. And I love the facets you've got in here. How did you get those in there? We stick it in a fixture that, that secures the row. And uh, with several different files and rasp, we'll... Uh, Put those facets in there. Hand file. Hand file. Kind of tricky. A lot of work. It takes a little time for sure. All right. Well, we better get into it then. Let's do it. It's going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs>
Banging with a hammer and Brad our buttons on. Brad the buttons on. Yes. Are we also going to put the rowl on now? Going to get to put the rowl in. Yeah, so a little bit, make a little music, a little sing. All right. And the buttons are for the, the strap that goes over the top. Right, which holds it on the boot. And after that, what's left? A little polishing and, and uh, we're ready to go. A little more cleaning, then we'll be using them. Mount up. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll watch you here and, uh, and maybe I'll give it a shot too. Sure. Well, I'll do the first one and then you can go at it. This is beautiful. Thanks. I mean, it really is very cool. Well, we've done a good job, I feel like. It's, it looks nice. It sure does. And and they're totally functional this way. Ready to go. I mean, they got the leather straps on, these go on boots, go out riding right now. Absolutely, completely functional. But you often take it to the next level. We only have half the story told here. Uh, we're trying to take a, a, a master craft here uh -huh. and turn it into ornamental art. Okay. The next step. All right. And that's what this here represents, right? Yes. Like this spur is basically the same as what we just did. Duplicate steel. Except work. for one, this one here has been blued. It's been overlaid with sterling silver and then, and then blued, which is a black oxide and all engraved up. And it's just beautiful. Oh, thank I, you. I couldn't imagine wearing these. Well, thank They're, you. They look so great. Yeah. That's, the, that's the goal. Uh, as I want it to look like, I, I have to put it on, I have to use it, but it's so pretty I can't. And you do all the engraving and all the silver work yourself, right? Absolutely. Right here. Right you here. got a scope and you got a gravers and all kinds of stuff. Yes, sir. The bench is set up and spent a lot of time here. Beautiful work. And this pair here is amazing too. Thanks. That's... I mean, what kind of hours do you have in something like this? Honestly, I've spent three months on the piece before. Three have you really? Months. Yeah, so. You can spend a lot of time on stuff and just how deep you want to get into the story. Well, it certainly shows, man. And I had a great time. I learned a ton. Well, thank you so much. I couldn't have been more honored to have you in my shop. Well, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. What do you say we go out for a ride? Let's do it. All right. A little bit more fun. <laughs> what a great experience I had working with Wilson. He taught me that patience is the virtue of any craftsman. Not only is he incredibly skilled, he's on a mission to educate people about the cowboy culture. And that's a legacy to be proud of.